Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to hear you all in a good mood. <laughs> yes, I've changed back into my civilian clothes, which is a coat and tie. Occupational hazard, I think. Uh, I do not have anything at the top, so we can go uh, straight to your questions. Kevin, you want to start? Sure. Uh, Josh, in keeping with the President's trip to Miami tomorrow uh, regarding the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. uh, is the President alarmed about the, uh, the premium increases that pe many people are seeing, as well as insurers, major insurers, exiting the program in some, some markets? And is it a sign that you know, some changes are needed? Well, Kevin, the President has been clear that the Affordable Care Act has had enormous benefits for Americans all across the country. There, since the Affordable Care Act went into effect, uh, we have seen the overall growth in health care costs uh, held down. Uh, we have seen 20 million Americans get access to health care. These are Americans who didn't previously have access to health insurance before the Affordable Care Act. And we have seen millions of Americans all across the country benefit from the kinds of consumer protections that they've long been denied. Uh, these are com consumer protections that uh, protect uh, people from having to declare bankruptcy uh, because they essentially exceed the lifetime limit that is imposed on their, by their health insurance company. Those lifetime limits uh, are no longer allowed. Individuals cannot be discriminated against because they have a pre-existing condition. Um, so these kinds of consumer benefits have uh, not just help those Americans who are shopping for health insurance on in the individual market, those are consumer protections that also benefit the 150 million Americans that get their health insurance through their employer. So those kinds of improvements are obvious benefits of the Affordable Care Act uh, and, um, you know, obviously uh, all critical reasons why the President fought so hard to have this law go into effect. Now, I, I think you're acknowledging uh, something that the President has discussed before, too, uh, which is that there are some uh, tweaks to the law that could be implemented that would further improve its performance. Uh, and the President has laid out some ideas for what those tweaks would look like, including further enhancing competition in the marketplace by uh, allowing the creation of a public option. Um, that, would, uh, that added competition in all 50 states would, uh, we believe, have the effect of further challenging private health insurance companies to improve their offerings and reduce their prices. Um, so these are the kinds of things that the next Congress will have to consider. Obviously, the current Congress is one that's dominated by Republicans who have voted more than 50 times to repeal the law, but have not once in the last six years actually put forward their own alternative proposal. So uh, it's clear that Republicans in Congress don't share the President's interest in trying to improve our health care system in this country. Uh, maybe the next batch of uh, members of Congress will, and hopefully we'll have a President uh, like the candidate that President Obama has endorsed, who is determined to build on the uh, remarkable success of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but would a public option bring insurers like United and Aetna back into the program? Um, uh, what in particular is the administration thinking the next president, the next Congress should do to bring insurers back into the <coughs> program? Isn't that a sign of a, of a healthy uh, Affordable Care Act if you have more insurers coming in rather than exiting? Uh, well, potentially that is, uh, uh, well, I, I think what we're talking, there, I think there are two different questions. The first is one way that you can add competition is essentially to uh, add another entity that's committed to competing in markets all across the country. Uh, and that's exactly what the public option um, would, uh, would do. Uh, the question is, are there other tweaks that you could make that would make it um, more attractive uh, to some of the companies that you mentioned uh, to uh, engage more deeply in, um, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, so the public option is not the only suggested uh, tweak that the President uh, would consider. Uh, but again, this is not something that he's going to be in a position to consider because we already know that this Congress is not going to act on it. Um, but there, uh, the President has in mind that there could be additional tweaks that could be made that would further uh, enhance competition in the marketplace. And again, this is sort of rooted in a principle that has long been championed by Republicans, this idea of the free market driving the, uh, the uh, health insurance industry in a way that ends up being good for consumers. It has to be regulated, uh, but you know, regulated in a way that promotes competition, and that kind of competition 
uh, can be good for consumers. And we've seen that. Uh, but there is more that we can do to further improve. Thank you. Okay. Roberta. Um, Secretary Burwell said today that she expects 1.1 million more people to sign up on the exchanges this year. Um, that's out of about <coughs> 10.7 million people who are uninsured who are eligible. How does the White House feel about that level of um, expected enrollment, 1.1 million out of 10.7 possible? Well, uh, the 1.1 million increase, I, I believe, is uh, an increase of uh, 8 or 9 percent over um, over last year. So we're talking about 1.1 million additionally uh, enrolling uh, during the open enrollment period this year. I believe last year we ended up somewhere uh, between 13 and 14 million. So uh, that represents a continuing increase uh, in the number of people who are uh, enrolling for health insurance through the marketplace. And this goes to the the question that, that Kevin uh, raised, which is the more people that are competing in that market, uh, the uh, more attractive uh, it is to uh, companies that are engaged in that kind of business. And the more companies that are engaged in that business who are competing for that pool of customers, uh, the more pressure we're going to put on prices to uh, not increase at the same rate. And we're also going to put pressure on those companies to improve their offerings. So this kind of enhanced competition is uh, uh, an important part of what the Affordable Care Act is uh, uh, focused on. Prior to the Affordable Care Act going into effect, you'll recall, there was no such thing as a marketplace. And individuals who weren't able to purchase health insurance through their employer, which I'll remind you is the vast majority of people uh, who uh, currently um, have health insurance, uh, but for those who are on on the individual market were left to fend for themselves. Uh, and there was not a mechanism in place to regulate the offerings that were put forward uh, by individual insurance companies in a way that allowed individuals to effectively compare offerings from different uh, companies. Um, so you know, these are the kinds of improvements on a system that was uh, largely unregulated uh, in a way that disadvantaged consumers. Uh, but you know, the kinds of tweaks that we're talking about here are tweaks that would further regulate this market in a way that would enhance competition and improve the ability of individuals to go and purchase uh, health insurance on the individual market. But by, by calling it a tweak, um, I mean, setting up a public option sounds like more than a tweak. Wouldn't that be a major legislative and administrative undertaking? Well, uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry, by, by calling it a tweak, doesn't it sort of underplay or downplay the amount of legislative and administrative work it would take to set up a public option to uh, sort of address that gap? Uh, I, I, don't mean to, uh, I don't mean to downplay it. I, I think that this would be uh, an important change that would improve the system. But I also wouldn't exaggerate the kind of change that this would necessitate. So many of the changes that already went, on, went into effect as a result of the Affordable Care Act were difficult to implement because of the significant um, changes that it brought to this individual, to the regulation of this individual market. And uh, adding an additional offering is a substantial change, but it doesn't reflect uh, you know, a complete overhaul, if you will, of the marketplace mechanism that was put in place by the Affordable Care Act. The, I'm sorry I was distracted in answering your question, because there's one other element of this, that I, of this debate that I think is relevant, two other elements, actually. The first is, so much of what we're talking about when we're talking about competition and when we're talking about prices, there has understandably uh, been a lot, an intense focus on the increase in costs in the individual market. These are individuals who have to purchase their health insurance during this open enrollment period at healthcare.gov in marketplaces. The vast majority of Americans, again, 150 million Americans, uh, get their health insurance through their employer. And five out of the last six years, um, we have seen that the growth in premium increases is the lowest that it's been on record. So we've seen about 3% increases in premiums among people who get their health insurance through their employer. That represents tangible progress in limiting the growth in health care costs in a way that benefits both employers and employees. That is one often overlooked benefit of the Affordable Care Act. And again, I think there should be, and the President believes there should be, focus on, on uh, what we see in terms of rates in the individual market. 
but it's important to recognize that 10 times as many people get their health insurance through their employer. And the impact that we've seen in keeping the growth in health care costs low, the lowest on record, five out of the last six years, uh, is a remarkable benefit of the Affordable Care Act. The second thing is, when you're talking about these marketplace consumers, individuals uh, who, who do purchase their health, their health insurance through the marketplace, even though we are seeing cost increases all across the country, the fact of the matter is we do expect that next year more than half of the people who seek to purchase health insurance plans through the marketplace will be able to do so for $75 a month or less. And the reason for that is that even though we are seeing an increase uh, in costs in some states, the government subsidy that goes along with those costs also increases to limit costs for insurers to make uh, health care affordable for people. So um, you know, this is something I do anticipate that we're going to uh, you know, be talking about quite a bit uh, during the fall. So I appreciate your interest in this. And obviously, the President uh, will be discussing this uh, uh, in Miami tomorrow. But I, you know, we'll have an opportunity to spend some more time working through these numbers. And just briefly, um, is he going to Miami to give this speech tomorrow um, for some thematic reason having to do with Obamacare? Or is it just related to the other travel that he's doing? No, it's a, for them, the thematic reason is that you know we are you know essentially within about ten days of right. the open Miami, enrollment Miami. beginning. What does Miami? Or well, there are have there to are, there's a large population in Miami of young people in particular that we want to make sure understand the kinds of benefits that are available to them through the Affordable Care Act, and uh, having covered our efforts over the two previous years, the last few years, uh, the three previous years of trying to raise the awareness among young adults across the country, we have sought to target those. Uh, communities across the country that have a larger proportion uh, of young people who are eligible for coverage on the marketplace but have not yet taken advantage of it. Florida is also a particularly powerful illustration of the situation because we have seen Republicans in, in the state of Florida block Medicaid expansion. And what we have seen, and studies show, even studies that are not conducted by the government, indicate that those states that did not expand Medicaid, where you had Republicans who blocked the expansion of Medicaid, we did actually see health care costs for everybody else go up. And we've seen costs in the marketplace increase an additional 7 percent in those locations in those states that didn't expand Medicaid. So I recognize that there is, look, in some ways you could actually describe this as an effort by Republicans to sabotage the Affordable Care Act. Because you have Republicans in individual states essentially preventing some people from getting health insurance that's paid for by the federal government through Medicaid, or almost entirely paid for through the federal government um, through Medicaid, that's having a negative impact on the ability of other people to afford health care through the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so, it's un again, it's unfortunate the degree to which Republicans have chosen to play politics with the Affordable Care Act in a way that has not just prevented millions of people across the country from being able to get access to health care through expanded Medicaid, but also driving up the costs of millions more Americans because of their political decision to block Medicaid expansion. Okay. Mark. Josh, speaking of politics, can I follow up on, on the President's uh, stop whining comments from yesterday and, and Trump's charges about a rigged election? Yeah. Uh, the other part of the question, which I don't think he answered, was okay. is he, is the administration concerned about post-election violence? And frankly, I'll add to that question by saying is the administration making any kinds of contingency plans? Well, Mark, I, I think the President, as he did uh, he alluded to this in his answer yesterday. The, the President retains significant confidence in the strength and durability of the U.S. election system. Uh, you know, we have typically talked about that in the context of what the IC has concluded about Russia's efforts to try to undermine confidence in that system. Uh, but the President believes there's a lot of people, there are many reasons for the American people to have confidence in the integrity of that system, uh, even in the face of some of these uh, Russian led efforts. But even separate from that, there has been a concerted effort by uh, at least one candidate to talk down the U.S. system of democracy. Uh, and uh, that's unfortunate, and uh, that's, that was the substance of the President's comments yesterday. I think the President is pretty confident that um, not many people will be persuaded uh, by uh, an effort to 
run down the U.S. Uh, system of elections. And I'll just point out that, you know, over the last three or four days, we have seen the running mate to the Republican nominee indicate that he would respect the outcome of the election. And earlier today, we saw the campaign manager for the Republican nominee indicate her confidence in the integrity of our voting system. So, you know, I don't know if they need to have a staff meeting or maybe more broadly circulate a memo, uh, but uh, I think the comments of the running mate and the campaign manager, I think reflect the sentiments of Americans in both parties who believe that our democracy benefits from the vigorous conduct of an election, but we also benefit from an acceptance of the result, an acceptance of the expression of the will of the American people, and a commitment by leaders in both parties to follow the will uh, of the American people. And this was an important part of the President's answer that I, I, I do think was a little overlooked, which is the President articulated, despite his vigorous disagreements with Mr. Trump that we have in no way sought to minimize, the President did pledge that if the American people do make a decision uh, to uh, entrust Mr. Trump with the powers of the presidency, um, the President would fulfill the commitment that he has made to ensure the successful and smooth transition of power in our democracy. Uh, our system of government and our democracy depends on people who serve in positions of power who are willing to put the interests of the American people over their own. Uh, and the President has strong feelings about the outcome of this election, but if the American people disagree, the President's prepared to honor the will of the American people. Hopefully that's not going to come about, but uh, I, I think that's a, a reflection of the President's uh, commitment to this issue, that he's willing to, um, to exercise his own significant authority consistent with the approach he's hoping that everybody else will take. Right, Josh. My question was about violence specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've our colleagues who are out at campaign rallies and such, you know, hear and see people talking and holding signs, talking about taking <coughs> action of one sort or another, uh, if there's an outcome that they don't believe is credible. Is, is, is that something that the President finds worse? Well, I, th I think anytime anyone is talking about using violence to advance a political goal in one form or another, the President is concerned about that. And the President believes that there's no place for that in our democracy. In fact, our system of government, our democracy was established to, in an ideal world, aid our ability to resolve our differences through debate and negotiation and not without resorting to violence. And so, you know, there have been instances of, you know, where violence has broken out at particular rallies. We saw a, a, a campaign office in North Carolina, a Republican campaign office uh, in North Carolina. Uh, that was vandalized. And, um, you know, the President hasn't, you know, didn't get asked about it yesterday, but uh, I'm confident his views are consistent with what I expressed here on Monday, which is to condemn uh, that kind of vandalism, to condemn that kind of violence. Uh, and uh, that is consistent with uh, the President's view that um, it is not appropriate to resort to violence to achieve a, a political goal. And is the President's concern sufficient that some sort of contingency planning is or ought to be underway. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of any sort of contingency planning that's currently underway. Obviously, uh, the President's going to rely on uh, law enforcement organizations and the Department of Homeland Security to make recommendations to him uh, if any recommendations are necessary. Uh, you know, obviously, there is uh, you know, a long tradition in this country of law enforcement uh, decisions being made at the community level. Uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, we'd expect that uh, local law enforcement organizations would take the steps that they believe are appropriate to keep the peace in their communities. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm not aware of any specific planning that's been undertaken um, uh, with regard to that potential outcome at this point. Uh, but you know, we're also still three weeks out from Election Day, so uh, you know, we'll continue to monitor this situation. And if, uh, uh, if we need to engage in some contingency planning, then we'll do that. Okay. Jordan. Thanks, Josh. On a separate but related topic, there's a new report out today showing that anti-Semitic abuse on Twitter is on the rise, and the report linked that abuse to supporters of Donald Trump. And I'm wondering if the, is the President aware of this phenomenon, and um, how much, if so, how much responsibility does he think that Trump shares for the uptick in abuse? Well, uh, 
I, I saw some new, news coverage of the report. I didn't read the, the report itself. What um, the president ha has expressed, again, to all of you on a number of occasions, his uh, concern about the kind of rhetoric that has been so carelessly used in the context of uh, this election season. The, the president understands that uh, the stakes in this election are high and that he would expect people to engage in a vigorous debate, uh, but you believe that's, that that debate should be carried out consistent with uh, the values in this country that we cherish, and those values include uh, not targeting or discriminating against people because of their religion. And the Obama administration has worked with, the, with Twitter on shutting down channels related to ISIS and other extremist groups. Um, in this instance, does the administration believe that Twitter should be doing more to curb this kind of abusive language on its platform? Yeah. Well, you know, obviously the, the administration is deeply respectful of the authority that Twitter should exercise in you know, controlling um, or at least protecting the freedom of people. Uh, to use Twitter to express their views. Uh, I know that, you know that that Twitter has faced many of their own questions about uh, where to draw the lines. Uh, you know, where do you draw the line from uh, freely expressing your view to advocating violence or inciting violence in one form or another? Um, so you know, these are difficult questions, uh, but they also relate directly to uh, the First Amendment rights of American citizens. So uh, I think uh, Twitter has uh, you know, taken, assumed this responsibility, um, understanding how uh, serious this question is. Uh, and uh, you know, they have frequently responded constructively to a desire on the part of the administration to make it harder for terrorist organizations to incite violence uh, using social media platforms like Twitter. I think the questions are a little bit different when we're talking about the tone and rhetoric that's used in the context of a political debate. Uh, but um, you know, I, I know that these are questions that Twitter has carefully considered and um, you know has tried to uh, has tried to confront you know, both because of the responsibility that they have to all of their users, but also uh, because the the success of their platform is going to depend on them establishing some rules of the road that are fair. Uh, they certainly don't want to preside over a platform that muzzles dissent, where you have people who are uh, um, taking a platform that should be used to uh, freely express one's views uh, and you know, ultimately shut down uh, the ability of individuals to express those views. But on the other hand, I think they're going to have a hard time recruiting people to join and participate actively in the Twitter community if the Twitter community is littered with hateful, violent images and rhetoric. Okay, Mark. Uh, Josh, do you have any reaction from President Obama to the invitation to his half-brother to be at the debate tonight from the Trump campaign? Uh, I haven't spoken to him about it, but um, uh, I, I don't anticipate that the President has spent a lot of time uh, considering whether or not his uh, brother-in-law should uh, attend the debate. Uh, if he does choose to attend, hopefully he'll do something more fun than just attend the debate. Uh, um, can you describe their relationship? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know much about it. My understanding is that there's not much of one. On the schedule for tomorrow, which kind of comes first in the planning of tomorrow's trip? Was it the uh, uh, Obamacare event or the political events? Well, uh, Mark, you recall that this was actually a, a trip that the president had uh, previously planned to take to Florida earlier this month but the trip was rescheduled as a result of um, Hurricane Matthew that was predicted to make landfall. Um, and we wanted to ensure that the President's trip didn't disrupt any of the um, activities that were underway to, to plan for the uh, eventual landfall of the hurricane. Um, so you, in the context of that previous trip, the President was planning to deliver a speech uh, about the Affordable Care Act uh, in Tampa, uh, and just for the sake of slimming down the trip and making it more efficient. Um, you know, he'll deliver that speech in Miami instead, but he'll also, um, we've also rescheduled the, uh, the political activities that the President was previously uh, planning to, uh, to lead while he was there as well.
So the um, Affordable Care Act event came first in the planning? Uh, that's my understanding, but you know, obviously it's complicated because we had originally planned the trip, we pulled it down and then, then so in the rescheduling of the trip, I guess I would say, we planned them both because both of them had been part of the original plan. Uh, so it's hard to say that one came first because we essentially were trying to reschedule both activities and or both sets of activities. Sorry, were you able to get a, um, a check with advance about the use of the presidential seal at political events? Yeah, I, I haven't gotten, uh, I did have a conversation about this. I haven't gotten greater clarity about what um, guides the decision about whether or not to use the seal. Um, but, you know, what is clear and, you know, what you have clearly noticed uh, is that there are some occasions where we use it uh, and some occasions where we don't. I'm not, I don't have a lot of insight into how that decision is made, but I'll see if I can get some more information on it. Appreciate it. it. Okay. Ron? Just on the uh, uh, half-brother issue again, um, mm -hmm. does the President see this as a perhaps subtle or not so subtle echo of the birther issue? Um, uh, no, I, I, I don't think it is. I, I have to admit, I, I really don't know exactly what the intent is of uh, this invitation, other than probably to get you guys to ask me about it. Um, <laughs> but even then, I'm not really sure what goal that uh, accomplishes, but you can... Uh, I guess you can check with the people who offer the invitation. I think we have. Okay. <laughs> and what do they say? I, I don't know. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> Let me check with my. Uh, um, some people have described um, Mr. Trump's tactics as, as sort of a scorched earth policy or, or approach in recent days. Is that, do you think that's accurate? Well, I know that other analysts have observed that it doesn't appear to be a vote getting strategy either. Uh, but look, I. You know, for the for the strategy that they're engaged in, they're not looking for advice uh, from me, uh, and um, I think that's pretty evident from uh, some of the strategies that they've chosen to pursue. But um, you know, I'll let him run his campaign, and uh, they've got three weeks left to try to execute whatever strategy they believe uh, is most likely to lead to success. Fair to say, the president's going to be watching the debate tonight with interest. Uh, look, I, I think uh, like most Americans, the president uh, is interested to uh, to see what happens in this final confrontation between the two candidates. There's an opportunity for um, you know, each candidate to, uh, in some ways, deliver a closing argument. This will be the last major platform that both candidates have, and uh, that makes it uh, that makes for an important moment. And uh, the president, uh, again, like most Americans who are following this election, and that's uh, a lot of people, uh, is interested to see what's going to happen. On another issue, the, the email issue, not not the specifics of these e emails, but th there's still this constant release, this constant flow of hacked messages. Is that? Is that an indication that whatever the United States proportional response to this to the Russians was has not had its desired effect? Or is there any connection at all between any of that? Well, I, um, there's a lot there in that question. I, uh, let me start by saying I'm just not going to be able to sort of evaluate what sort of uh, response may eventually be mobilized um, with regard to the Russians and their effort to undermine our a political system in cyberspace. Um, so I'm not, you know, able to speak with uh, much specificity about uh, what actions have been taken, what actions have not been taken, whether any actions have been taken. And those are just questions I can't get into. Um, you know, what I'll say is that many of the releases are consistent with the tactics that the intelligence community of the United States has concluded were directed by the Russian government. And these kinds of tactics are consistent with uh, instructions that typically would require the involvement of senior level officials in the Russian government. And we have seen Russia engage in tactics in other democracies to try to undermine confidence in democratic institutions, primarily in Europe. Um, so, you know, these kinds of things are or these kinds of tactics are not necessarily new. Uh, but you know, what's also not new is that the American people have a lot of confidence in our system of democracy, in the durability of that system. If you think about our, you know, our history of carrying out elections in this country, they've, we've, they've survived a civil war, uh, multiple elections through two world wars, uh, obviously a cold war, uh, and there were adversaries. Um, you, mentioned, or, you mentioned confidence in the system, and I yeah. think that a lot of Americans don't have confidence in cyberspace that, that they may have had if they see 
these high profile individuals being hacked and the, you know, the administration's response is essentially we're going to respond or we have responded proportionally and, and trust us, we can't talk about it. What, what, why, what's reassuring about that? Because I think there is a lot of concern about whether in fact the administration is on top of this given the constant still flow of, of emails <coughs> that, that apparently been hacked. Well, let me try to help you understand our approach to this situation. One of the things that we have tried to help people understand is that even though our world is more connected through the internet than ever before, it's very difficult to hack the U.S. election system. Many elements of that election system are not connected to the internet. These systems of conducting elections, even in the context of a national election, are decentralized. You've got states and individual I'm not, localities. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about just uh, confidence in the electoral system. I'm talking about confidence in, in, in email and online activities, generally speaking. Okay. I mean, the, I think the, well, the, I guess, the election issue is a... Well, I'm, I'm glad you clarified that because what I'm talking about is our election system. And that is the, that is the system that we want to make sure that we are fortifying. Uh, and that is the system that people should have confidence in. With regard to cybersecurity and with regard to the willingness of Russia or other malevolent actors to try to uh, engage in malicious activity in cyberspace, that's not new. All of your news organizations have had to deal with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, the president has put forward his own cybersecurity strategies, uh, including a significant budget increase that Republicans in Congress refuse to even talk about. Uh, we believe there is more that, that, uh, that Congress should do to invest in our cybersecurity efforts that wouldn't just protect U.S. government networks, but also uh, the cybersecurity of the country more broadly. And there are significant national security and economic consequences for our success uh, in that endeavor. And uh, this administration continues to believe that's a priority. And I, you know, I, I would expect that that's something that um, you know, the president will spend some more time talking about it, yeah, even on uh, in his last three months in office. And what about the, the uh, specific case of Ecuador and Julian Assange and his being cut off from email? Did the United States have anything to do with that at all? Well, uh, my colleagues at the State, State Department, I know the suggestion on the part of some has been that, uh, that somehow Secretary Kerry may have tried to strong arm his Ecuadorian counterpart to undertake this action. Secretary Kerry said that that was not true, and we saw a statement from the Ecuadorians earlier today indicate that this is a decision that they made on their own. They have a sovereign foreign policy, and they made their uh, own conclusion uh, to pursue this, uh, uh, this action against Mr. Assange, and um, that's a, a decision that they've undertaken based on their own conclusion about what's in their country's best interest. Just, just, they just decided to, so, so again, just aside from Secretary Kerry, the position is that the United States had nothing to do with that decision. Well, again, I think the accusation was made about Secretary Kerry, and he said that that was not true. The State Department said that that was not true. And the Ecuadorians have said, we did this because we decided it was the right thing to do, not because anybody else told us to do it. So I think it's a pretty open and shut case here. Okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. If I could follow just a second. Uh, a spokesman for the uh, Czech National Police today announced that uh, a Russian national was arrested in Prague for uh, cyber attacks in the U.S. Are you aware of this report? Can you tell me anything about this individual? Uh, I am aware of the report. Uh, it is the subject of an ongoing law enforcement investigation, so I can't discuss uh, any of the details. Uh, my colleagues at the Department of Justice may be able to give you some more information about this particular individual. Uh, what I would say, though I think the one thing I can say about it is uh, you might cite this as one example of many where the United States Department of Justice takes very seriously the responsibility that they have to protect the United States and our interests in cyberspace. And uh, they have gone after criminal networks, uh, and they've even gone after individuals acting on behalf of nation states uh, to protect uh, our uh, cybersecurity here in the United States. That's a vigorous effort that they've undertaken, and um, that's, uh, uh, I think, a clear sign that the Department of Justice is playing <coughs> Uh, a vibrant role alongside other national security agencies in the United States government to protect the American people and to protect our cybersecurity. Is it a leap too far field to suggest that this is part of the proportional reaction to uh, the Russian attacking U.S. Uh, cyber well, uh, the, um, uh, I'd refer you to my colleagues at the Department of Justice about the decision that they made 
um, you know, with regard to uh, this particular individual. Uh, this is, uh, you know, as with all law enforcement decisions and law enforcement actions, those are taken independent of any sort of political um, uh, interference. Can I just push just a little bit more here about concerns about escalation? Uh, mm -hmm. I think there might be at least some concern on the part of the public that if there is a re proportional response to this and the Russians will simply go tit for tat on this, how big of a concern is that for uh, the United States government? I think it's an entirely legitimate concern. And I think it exposes, you've, you've uncovered here one of the significant challenges that policymakers fa face uh, in dealing with cyber policy. The rules of the road when it comes to cybersecurity in large part are not well established. And that makes it difficult. You know, it's hard to draw these kinds of analogies. They're very imperfect. But you know, one example uh, you know, might be um, you know, there are rules that guide uh, freedom of navigation of US ships. Uh, so you know, we've talked about how in the South China Sea, for example, the United States would, um, you know, uh, on several occasions, has undertaken freedom of navigation operations to signal um, or to send a signal about uh, the willingness of the United States to uh, fly, sail, and operate in international waters. And that's a well-established norm uh, that even though it might be occasionally irritating to some other countries, it's a norm that everybody um, acknowledges is uh, one that should be followed. Um, and when there's a violation of some of those well-established norms, like what Russia has done in Ukraine, for example, that's something that the international community acknowledges as a problem and acknowledges as worthy of a uh, internationally organized response. Those clear lines, those clear norms are not as well established in cyberspace. The technology is so new and our habits for interacting uh, in that realm uh, are not well established. That's why the G20, the president actually has tried to lead a discussion among other world leaders about trying to establish some of these rules of the road, uh, to try to establish some norms among the 20 largest economies of the world about what's acceptable in cyberspace uh, and what's not. Uh, and when those norms are violated, what's an appropriate response? Uh, this is something that's, uh, that we've made some progress on. Uh, you heard uh, Prime Minister Xi, when he was here at the White House a year or so ago, indicate uh, a specific commitment about not using particular uh, cyber strategies that are funded by the Chinese government uh, to steal secrets that could be, then be used to advantage uh, in an economic context a Chinese business. Uh, he acknowledged that that's something that the, the Chinese government um, uh, would not do. And that's, that, re that, represent, that was an important step that may not seem like much, but that actually does establish a pretty important norm and does guide uh, the behavior uh, of the United States and China in cyberspace, and that's a, that's a good thing. There's more work along those lines that needs to be done. Uh, and uh, this will, uh, you know, uh, establishing these kinds of rules of the road will be an important national security priority of the next president uh, in the same way that it has been for this president. Let me ask you about the, uh, the new actions to spur competition in the airline industry. I remember back in April, the president uh, had an executive order uh, among the uh, the ideas uh, requiring re refunds uh, for delayed baggage, for example, mm -hmm. uh, making the airline market fairer, more transparent, stopping the uh, uh, airlines from cherry picking the data. But when we read reports like this, almost immediately and instinctively, the airline industry and some of the larger players will say this is going to lead to increased costs. What's your response to that? Our, our response to that is that uh, airlines should not use the requirement to treat their passengers fairly as an excuse to further jack up prices. Again, I don't think there's anything that has, uh, this doesn't have anything to do with party politics. I think uh, most Americans believe that the airlines to whom they pay significant sums of money to help them get places should treat them fairly in return. Uh, and uh, there is an appropriate role for the United States government to play to ensure that the interests of consumers and the interests of people who are using our commercial aviation system in the United States are treated fairly by the companies who make a substantial profit by operating in this market. The U.S. airlines uh, are making good money. That's a testament to the business practice 
Uh, it's a testament to the innovation that we have seen, many of them pursue. So uh, there's nobody who's, who's, uh, uh, that I can think of that isn't rooting for their success. We all want an aviation system that functions effectively, that serves the needs of the American people. Uh, our quality of life and our economy depend on that. Uh, but we also have this uh, sense that those airlines, as they're performing that service and as they're making a substantial profit, should treat their customers fairly. Uh, and that certainly is something that the U.S. government is prepared to enforce. Lastly, I want to ask you about um, the uh, Project Veritas videos that uh, have been uh, making the rounds uh, of late. Uh, does the White House have any reaction to the dismissal or the severance of two veteran Democratic operatives after the release of the latest Project Veritas videos? And in particular, I want to draw your attention to uh, Robert Kramer, a convicted felon who visited the White House according to reports, 342 times, also met personally with the president some 47 times, the most recent occasion being in June of this year. Well, uh, I've been asked about um, uh, videos that have come from this outlet uh, in the past, and in each time I've tried to um, uh, urge people to take those reports not at face value, uh, and not just with a grain of salt, but maybe even a whole package of salt, uh, because um, despite what the name might suggest, uh, these videos have not often revealed the truth. Um, Do you have so, some people that were sort of shoved out or walked away based on the release of these videos? Yeah, and so uh, uh, that is true, and uh, so that's why I'm reluctant to comment directly on the videos themselves. I think there is a principle, though, that I will give voice to, which is I know that there was the suggestion uh, in some of these reports that um, it might be a clever organizing tactic or a clever uh, political tactic to try to incite violence at political rallies. Um, that's, uh, that is entirely inconsistent with uh, the President's view about community organizing and waging a vigorous campaign, uh, that uh, we should attempt uh, and we should uh, have so much confidence in the power uh, of our persuasion and in our arguments uh, that um, we shouldn't have to resort to violence. And in fact, it is completely inappropriate uh, to resort to violence to advance a political goal. And um, uh, that's a, that certainly is a principle that the President strongly believes in. As far as Craig was concerned, with all those visits here to the White House in particular, I'm, I'm wondering, is that a reflection of the ethical standards of the Obama White House that a guy like that uh, who, at least according to the videos, admittedly, uh, these videos are in some dispute in some circles, uh, seems to be uh, suggesting voter fraud, a person who is a convicted felon, who is an often frequent visitor here at the White House. It is a reflection, some would argue, of the standards of this White House, that that's the type of person that's here with that sort of frequency. Yeah. And, I, and I think at this point, I would urge extreme caution uh, and drawing conclusions about anybody's character based on uh, a few hours of uh, having looked at this video. Because time and time and time again, information that is released by this, information, by this uh, organization uh, is uh, a lot different than initial reports would indicate. Can I okay. follow up on that? Cheryl, uh, I'll come back to you. Go ahead, Cheryl. Um, switching the policy. Um, okay. Yesterday, the President said that the TTIP uh, negotiation had been discussed with the Italian Prime Minister. That's Can you give us any update on the status of that agreement? Uh, I don't know in how much detail they were able to discuss it. Uh, we'll see if we can get you some more information about the nature of their discussions on this issue. Uh, but I don't have an update for you in terms of our expectations. Uh, the President has tasked his team with a rather ambitious goal, which is to attempt to complete uh, TTIP negotiations by the end of the year. Uh, I know that they're, uh, speaking of the airline industry, I suspect they're being significantly subsidized by the Office of the United States Trade Representative. Uh, I know uh, individuals who work in that office have been logging some significant uh, miles in the air as they have traveled to Europe uh, to work on these negotiations. Um, and they're working hard to uh, try to meet the ambitious goal that the President's laid out. Uh, but you know, as is the case with all of these sorts of broad international agreements, nothing's agreed to until everything's agreed to, so it's hard to give you a good status update uh, other than to say that that uh, ambitious goal remains in place. and. Uh, those who have been tasked by the President of the United States to try to achieve that goal uh, are working hard to fulfill the mission that the President's given them. Just to, to 
put a little bit finer point on it. You, you just said nothing's agreed to until everything's agreed to. There is one train of thought that in an attempt to try to get closure this year or in this administration, that they that the TTIP, what they've agreed to so far could be closed out, leaving maybe a few issues to be negotiated later. Do you think mm -hmm. that's a possibility? Well, uh, at, at this point, I don't want to provide uh, sort of play-by-play -play, uh, of the negotiating efforts. You know, I, they, I um, want to give them the opportunity to consider a range of options, and they'll pursue. Uh, you know, the uh, Ambassador Froman and those on his staff will pursue the approach that they believe best serves the interests of the United States. Uh, and I wouldn't handicap at this point what the likely outcome uh, would be, um, other than to say the president has asked Ambassador Froman to pursue an ambitious goal and. I don't know, frankly, if it's one that they will be able to achieve, uh, but they are certainly uh, putting the time and effort uh, in pursuit of it, and we'll just have to see. The reason that I can't offer complete assurance that this is something that will be achieved is that Ambassador Froman is only going to agree to something that is in the best interest of the U.S. economy. So this is not a situation where the United States is prepared to take the first deal that uh, the Europeans put on the table. This is something that will be uh, negotiated rigorously. Uh, and again, the decision about whether or not to accept this deal will not be based on the President laying out an ambitious goal, but will be based on a clear-eyed assessment about whether or not it serves the interests of the American people and uh, would stand to uh, benefit the U.S. economy. Okay? Lana. Gosh, uh, the Justice Department says they'll be dispatching fewer uh, trained poll observers because of the Supreme Court decision on the Voting Rights Act. Um, is the White House concerned about the effect of this in any way on this election? Uh, I hadn't heard that announcement from the Department of Justice. I, um, so I, I guess I would refer you to them to uh, give them the opportunity to say whether or not they expect that this will have uh, much impact on their ability to uh, ensure the uh, effective conduct of the election. Overall, uh, the President retains uh, very high confidence uh, in the ability of our election system to function effectively and to yield uh, a result that reflects the, uh, the will of the American people. The President's also spoken at length about his uh, disappointment uh, that there has been an effort uh, by Republicans in states across the country and some Republicans in Congress to make it harder for some citizens to vote, to make it harder for um, veterans. Uh, some elderly voters, and yes, some college students and minority voters as well, to cast a ballot, even though they're eligible to do so. And uh, the President believes we should be making our uh, election system easier for people to participate in, not erect barriers that might make it harder for them to uh, cast a ballot if they're eligible. Uh, but um, those frustrations aside, uh, the President does have confidence that uh, whatever the outcome is on November 8th will be an accurate reflection of the uh, U.S. electorate. Confidence in the democratic process and the electoral system, but is the White House or the President concerned in any way about voter intimidation? Well, that's always something that, uh, you know, on the, on the eve of a hard-fought election that we are uh, aware of. Again, we want to make sure that every eligible American voter in this country has an opportunity to participate in our system, to cast a ballot, and to have it counted. And that's with regard to um, what, whatever political party they've uh, signed up with. Um, so uh, the President believes that this is uh, an important principle, and we would call on Democrats and Republicans uh, to work together to ensure that it's upheld in communities all across the country. Does the President think his uh, elder half-brother is being used as a prop in tonight's debate? Um, uh, again, I, I, I don't think the President's given a lot of consideration about uh, uh, the invitation that was extended uh, by, the, uh, by the Trump campaign, uh, in part because, again, I'm not really sure uh, what kind of message they're trying to send or what goal they think it may achieve, again, other than uh, having you guys ask me about it. So I guess they have. I guess they got you on that one, didn't they? Well, you know, uh, you're making a point that they're not that close. Do you know the last time that they spoke or were in touch? Uh, I don't know the last time they spoke. Um, getting back to Russia, I, when you're talking about the new rules for engagement in cyber warfare, um, there's the argument that you're not going to dis disclose if decisions have been made or what actions are being taken before they're being taken. Um, it's different 
than saying you're not going to tell the American public after those actions have been taken. Mm -hmm. Why, and, and the Vice President said as much when he was asked about this over the weekend, he said he hopes that the American public doesn't know about the uh, counter cyber strike that, that the President may order. Um, why shouldn't the American public believe that, that they are entitled to knowing when, when their government orders a cyber attack or the aftermath of a cyber attack <coughs> on a foreign nation? Well, let me, um, let me do a couple of things. The first is with regard to the, the, the premise of your question. Just to be really clear, uh, and I, and I, um, when I'm talking about establishing rules of the road, I'm talking about rules of the road in cyberspace, right? These, it doesn't just relate to cyber warfare. Uh, it also relates to uh, uh, espionage activity. It also relates to the, to the conduct of businesses in cyberspace. What kind of privacy policies do they have in place? What are the uh, rules and norms that will govern their analysis of big data, for example? Uh, these are all complicated questions, uh, and they have, co they have questions. These are questions that have a significant consequence, not just for our economy, but also for our national security. So uh, it's much broader than just sort of the realm of, of, of cyber warfare. Uh, with regard to cyber warfare, the President has discussed before the significant capabilities that are retained by the United States. These are capabilities that far exceed uh, any other countries. Uh, and um, some of those capabilities are based on uh, our ability to exploit information that only we know, potential loopholes in a, uh, in a particular system. Uh, and that's why we're just not going to be in a position to, to detail those activities publicly. Uh, it would undermine our ability to, uh, to do so. But the other aspect of your question that I want to make sure we're really clear about is that uh, an appropriate proportional response to Russia's conduct in cyberspace that we believe that our intelligence community has concluded is a concerted effort to undermine confidence in our political system is not just limited to the cyber realm. There are other tools through diplomacy, through the use of sanctions that could be used uh, as part of our uh, response to Russia's activities. And so, uh, it's important that as people consider, again, the appropriate policy response, uh, that they recognize that um, our options aren't just limited to um, a tit for tat. To go back to some of the examples that I've used before, the international response to Russia flagrantly violating the international norm that the that Ukraine's sovereignty is something that should be protected, or at least respected, was not to respond with military force. Russia violated that norm with military force, but the international response has, has not been to mobilize a military response. I recognize there may be some who advocate that. But the response from the international community has actually been able, has been to mobilize a diplomatic response that has left uh, Russia further isolated. Uh, there was an effort by the international community to mobilize uh, a response around imposing sanctions that have had a significant negative impact on the Russian economy. Uh, so um, you know, there are a variety of ways to, uh, to respond to the violation of, uh, uh, of certain norms. Um, and so just as people sort of try to understand what the administration's approach is here, I, I don't want people's thinking to be so constrained that the only potential response is some uh, secret offense, the, the deployment of a secret offensive cyber capability. The President's options are much broader than that. Sure. But in those examples, the American public would know about it. If we had, diplom if we had a diplomatic response, if we had economic sanctions that we were announcing against Russia, the American public would know about that. Mm -hmm. And my question is about um, a cyber response from the administration and the idea that the American public doesn't deserve to know about that. Well, I, I think it, it's not necessarily about dessert. Uh, you know, in this case, we're talking about um, you know, our ability to, um, to protect the, the American people and to protect our interests. Uh, so, um, you know, obviously there is oversight uh, of these activities. There is oversight within the executive branch. There is oversight uh, in Congress as well. You know, obviously there would be appropriate congressional committees that uh, will be a part of, uh, uh, of this discussion. So, um, there is independent oversight of these activities, but yes, there are this is an element of national security, which is that 
Uh, we can't talk about every single thing that the United States does to ensure that the American people are protected. And uh, the American people retain confidence in our uh, system of government, both because they understand why some of those details can't be revealed, but also because they recognize that there's a system of checks and balances that ensure that those actions are consistent with our national interest and consistent with the United States Constitution, and that there, our right to privacy and civil liberties uh, are not uh, trampled. Uh, and the President's been forceful in advocating for the kinds of reforms that build in those kinds of protections. Sorry to ask so many questions about this, but as you lay out, it's, it is an uncharted territory. And what you were saying just now about um, balance of government, congressional oversight, I just want to be clear. Are you saying that if the President were to direct... I'm not going to get into the hypothetical, so I'll just no, stop no, you there. Are, I guess what I'm saying, I'm just trying to understand what you just told me. Okay. Or, and the, did you just say that, that Congress would be consulted and have, uh, and have a check on the President ordering cyber retaliation? Uh, what I'm saying is that in a, I'm not going to talk about a, 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 a particular uh, hypothetical. What I'm saying is that there is congressional oversight over a range of national security authorities that the President of the United States retains uh, to protect the American people. Uh, and that is part of what gives the American people confidence that even when there are certain aspects of our national security strategy that we can't conduct, that we can't discuss publicly, mm -hmm. that they're conducted consistent with our nation's best interests uh, and with uh, uh, our values, including uh, the rights that uh, are enshrined in the United States Constitution. OK? All right. Michelle. As we heard the president now talk about his confidence in the election and in democratic systems. But the word rigged has now almost become a buzzword of this cycle. Um, it's all over the internet. Now those videos um, that we talked about earlier are circulating as um, possible proof that things will be rigged. Um, you know, there's talk of collusion and things like that. Do you think that that is a risk at this point? Does the president see that as a threat to things going smoothly after the election? I think most people see that kind of rhetoric as a farce. Uh, the idea that the Republican governors of Florida and Georgia and Arizona and North Carolina and Indiana and Ohio and Iowa are going to collude with Democrats is far-fetched, to say the least. And the fact that most people find this unconvincing I, I, the evidence that I have that most people find this unconvincing is that there are senior officials in the Republican Party who find this unconvincing, including the presidential Republican presidential nominee's running mate, who indicated that he would respect the results of the election. Another person who is unpersuaded by that argument of a potential bipartisan conspiracy is the Republican candidate's campaign manager. Uh, to say nothing of the Republican Speaker of the House, whose spokesperson has indicated that those kinds of conspiracy theories are far-fetched. Um, so again, as the President alluded to yesterday, uh, these uh, are the kinds of uh, conspiracy theories that are rarely floated by winners. Uh, it's the people who are not feeling good about the prospects um, of the outcome that would start raising these kinds of questions. That's particularly true in uh, athletic competitions. Uh, the people who are trailing on the scoreboard are the people who are most likely to complain about the officiating. Yeah, and in certain groups you really see that thought taking hold, though, I mean, a poll this month showed that um, about half of Donald Trump's supporters felt like rigging it, it is a possibility, and that half of them don't trust the outcome of the election. Do you have any thoughts on, on why you think that that is taking hold? Uh, no, I, I, I don't know why that might be taking hold, particularly because there's no evidence to substantiate those claims. And the President alluded to this in his answer yesterday as well. There have been studies to examine whether or not to follow up on anecdotal reports of widespread voter fraud. And there's never been evidence mo mobilized to indicate widespread voter fraud that would change the outcome of an election. There's, you know, there, are, there, are, there certainly are, um, you know, colorful uh, anecdotes from generations ago 
but you know, of studies that were conducted of the last three or four presidential elections, where you know more than a billion votes were cast, um, you know, there's basic there is no evidence of widespread voter fraud. So it's um, and you know there are a variety of reasons for that. Our election systems are so decentralized. Um, you've got Democrats and Republicans in different states who preside over those election systems. Uh, you've got a whole system of, of poll watchers and uh, other election officials who um, believe in the system and despite their own party affiliation are mostly committed to the success of our democracy. That's how most Americans feel. That's certainly how the current President of the United States feels. Okay, and it was as recently as late August during a fundraiser, um, the President said that he was tired of talking to Don about Donald <coughs> Trump and he felt like he didn't need to make a case against him because he felt that Donald Trump was making the case against himself very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was eight weeks ago. Um, what has changed the President's mind so distinctly that now he, you know, will take a, a, a question about Trump and he'll, he'll run with it? I think some of it is that he is concerned about some of the claims that are being made. He is concerned about the incessant false claim that the election is subject or at least susceptible to rigging. Undermining our democracy in that way is not good. It doesn't benefit the country. It may benefit one person in our country. Uh, but it doesn't benefit our system. Uh, and it certainly is inconsistent with the long bipartisan tradition of respecting the outcome of our political elections. Uh, and the President himself indicated his own commitment to this principle in his answer yesterday. In the event that the American people do choose Donald Trump to be the 45th President of the United States, the President would have grave concerns about that, but the President would be committed to ensuring a seamless and smooth transition in power uh, and would, uh, you know, as the President noted yesterday, personally escort Mr. Trump to Capitol Hill so that he could participate in the inauguration. That is what uh, the previous 43 presidents have done. That is what the 43rd President of the United States, a Republican, did for the 44th Democratic President of the United States. Uh, and the President would certainly fulfill that tradition even if uh, it meant um, helping somebody that he vigorously disagrees with. And that would mean putting aside his own personal feelings because of his commitment to our country and our democracy. So is he no longer tired of talking about Donald Trump and he no longer feels that Donald Trump is making a case against himself? Yeah. Well, look, I think I, uh, I think I feel confident in speaking for everybody in this room in saying that we all are tired of it. <laughs> yes. Tolu. Uh, thanks, Ross. Um, Senator Rubio said in a statement uh, today that um, He's not going to talk about the WikiLeaks uh, emails. Uh, he basically said that Democrats are being targeted today by the Russians, and it could be uh, Republicans tomorrow. Um, do you agree with that stance? And if it is Republicans tomorrow, do you say that Democrats shouldn't capitalize on, uh, on those emails? Well, I'm not aware that Democrats have. Uh, what I, I think what I'll say is that you've seen the way that I've handled it, uh, which is that I've been uh, very reluctant to comment on the emails of a private citizen that were stolen, particularly when we know that the tactics for stealing and disseminating that information, according to our intelligence community, are at least similar to the tactics that are used by the Russian government to undermine confidence in our political system. So, uh, you know, I've been very reluctant to to uh, discuss reports uh, about those stolen emails. Um, but everybody's going to have to make up their own decision, uh, make up their own mind about uh, the most appropriate way to answer those questions. Uh, I think I was sort of trying to get at if, uh, if there was a Russian-inspired hack of Donald Trump's tax returns or his business dealings. Are you confident that Democrats wouldn't capitalize on media reports about that and would take the same? Well, again, I think everybody would have to, would have to make their own uh, make up their own mind about how they want to uh, handle that situation. But, uh, you know, I've obviously been um, uh, uh, loath to discuss publicly the stolen private emails of a private citizen. 
Also, somewhat similarly about WikiLeaks, uh, viewers, uh, the question about the Ecuadorian decision not to or to cut uh, Assange's uh, internet. You were a little bit, I guess, indirect about uh, whether or not the U.S. government was involved at all. I'm not sure that's true, but if there's an opportunity for me to clarify, I will endeavor to do so. That decision by the Ecuadorian. But this is a this is a decision that's made by a sovereign government, uh, so I'm not going to weigh in one way or the other. Uh, the Ecuadorian foreign minister put out a statement uh, indicating that they made this decision. Uh, they didn't do it because anybody asked them to. They did it because they believe it was in the best interest of their country. Uh, why they've reached that conclusion uh, is something that you should uh, direct to them. Just one more. Uh, the UN humanitarian chief said that the United Nations believes up to 1.5 million people in Mosul will be at great risk of being targeted or caught in the crossfire or forcibly expelled or used as human shields in the, uh, the, the effort to free that city. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the administration, what the military has seen so far uh, in terms of the humanitarian uh, impact of the efforts to free Mosul and what's being done to limit the, uh, the human casualties. Yeah. Uh, of that. Well, the, the first fact that I want to mention, uh, because it's important that it not be overlooked, uh, you, you cited that you know as this operation is undertaken, it could potentially put the citizens of Mosul at grave risk. The citizens of Mosul are already at grave risk. We already know that they're subject to violence. We already know that they're used as human shields. We already know that some of them have faced violence and humiliation and targeting just because of their uh, religious views or because they may have not been sufficiently supportive of the self-appointed ISIL leadership of that community. Um, so the humanitarian situation in Mosul is already grave. Uh, and the potential for certain humanitarian contingencies should not be used as an excuse to put off undertaking this operation, what we should do and what the international community has done, as the President acknowledged yesterday, is to plan for those potential contingencies. Uh, and this planning has been led by the United Nations with the strong support of the rest of the international community. Uh, and so there are billions of dollars that have been pledged by the United States and the rest of the international community uh, to plan for the humanitarian consequences of clearing ISIL from communities all across Iraq. Uh, that we have had uh, important success in helping people move back into cities like Ramadi and Tikrit. Uh, these are cities that ISIL previously controlled. These are communities that ISIL sabotaged on their way out the door. Uh, and the international community, with the important influence of the UN, but in a way that was entirely supportive of the sovereignty of the Iraqi central government, worked to rebuild those communities, worked to help citizens return to their homes in those communities, worked to ensure that there is a police force on the ground to protect law and order in those communities. And that's been an uh, important effort all across Iraq. Uh, nearly one million Iraqis have returned to their homes, including 95 percent of the population from Tikrit. Uh, and about 200,000 people who have returned to uh, Ramadi. So there is a template for managing situations like this. What's also true, and I think why your question is an important one, is that Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq. There is a large population. Mosul is larger than uh, Tikrit and Ramadi. Uh, so we're dealing with uh, a contingency that could be on a much larger scale. Uh, and that's why for the last several months, You've seen, seen an Iraqi-led, UN-coordinated uh, effort uh, to mobilize resources, everything from food and water to medicine and temporary housing facilities, so that if a humanitarian contingency does arise, that there are resources in place to deal with it. Uh, so uh, this is a significant challenge, uh, and it will um, require the rest of the international community uh, being deeply engaged uh, to make sure that, uh, that this is a success, not just in terms of carrying out the military operation, but also in terms of rebuilding and restoring a, a community that uh, I think we'll find once ISIL has been driven out uh, has really taken a toll uh, because of the uh, depraved tactics that are regularly used by ISIL. Thanks, John. Okay. Dave.
Josh, thanks. Uh, back on the Project Veritas story, I understand you're, um, well, you don't want to comment on the video itself, but in a general sense, can you assure voters that the DNC is not engaging in dirty tricks in this campaign? Well, listen, I, I, what I can assure you of is that the um, statements that you saw from Democratic officials uh, that Kevin alluded to utterly disavowed those tactics. Uh, and I think you've heard me disavow those tactics. And so there should be no um, misunderstanding that the use of violence uh, or um, you know, any other things that could be construed as a dirty trick uh, is, is not condoned by the President of the United States, uh, and is not consistent with the kinds of values that we cherish in this democracy, uh, particularly when you consider the stakes in this election, and particularly when you consider uh, the broad appeal for the arguments that are being put forward by Democrats. Um, Democrats should be quite confident in the persuasive power uh, of our arguments, and it's important for us to make sure that those arguments are heard uh, and that people are sufficiently motivated to get out to the polls and cast votes that reflect the persuasive power of those arguments. Is the President a friend of Bob Kramer? Uh, that's not how I would describe him. Um, I. Uh, I, Kevin alluded to the fact that uh, Ms. Kramer may have been at the White House a number of times, but, uh, but no, he's not a friend of the President. Okay. Jean, I'll give you the last one. Thank you, Josh. Or Susan, I'll give you the last one, so Jean will. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, if Hillary Clinton is elected President of the United States, will go after the Obama administration's policy toward North Korea? Well, I think that's probably a question that you should direct to her campaign. Um, they can talk about what she will do as President of the United States. Um, I, I think I can just speak in general terms that obviously uh, having served in, uh, as a Secretary of State under President Obama, she played an important role in um, strengthening our relationships uh, throughout the Asia Pacific that have put the United States in a better position to confront uh, North Korea for their destabilizing activities and their willingness to violate a, a wide range of international obligations. Um, but, uh, but with regard to what she would do as President of the United States, uh, I'd encourage you to touch base with her campaign. Uh, what is the uh, President Obama's final destination of the North Korean uh, nuclear issue? What's the final destination? Yes. Well, l listen, I, um, uh, the President's foremost concern is doing what's necessary to protect the American people. And uh, the President has also made a deep commitment to ensuring that the United States will stand with our allies in the face of the provocations from the North Koreans. And that's why you've seen uh, uh, talks with the South Korean government uh, to deploy a counter ballistic missile battery in South Korea uh, advance as quickly and as far as they have. Um, there's been a deployment of other radar and anti-missile systems. Uh, in Japan and in Guam and other places throughout the Asia Pacific to better protect our allies and the American people. Uh, and that's our foremost concern. Um, but we also are going to continue to work with the rest of the international community to further isolate the North Korean regime and apply uh, additional pressure to them uh, to convince them that they should pursue the kind of policies that are in the best interest of their people. Uh, and the best interests of uh, what should be a shared goal of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. Could it be more aggressively approaching North Korea? Well, I don't have a policy change to signal at this point, but the, the President's foremost concern is the safety and security of the American people and our allies, and I think that's been consistent with the kinds of policies that the President has implemented uh, over his eight years in office. Okay. Susan, I'll give you the last one. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to follow up on Dave's question. Okay. But, um, so how would you describe the President's relationship with Dr. Uh, again, I, I, I'm not sure that I can describe it because I'm not sure that there's, there's much of one. I know that they've met before, but I, uh, again, I uh, met 40 times personally, and he was here 300 times. Why well, we can get you some more details on that. I don't, I don't want you to rely on those and leave people with the suggestion that somehow these are, you know, 40 different one-on-one -on -one meetings in the Oval Office. Uh, that would not be true, but we'll see if we can get you some more information about that. That would be helpful because okay. it's out there on the uh, on the interwebs saying that he's been here and they're showing the records from yes. the White House. I know why they're out there. 
They're out there because the, the, the Obama administration is the most transparent White House in American history, and we can have this conversation because we have disclosed those, that information proactively. We do that on a regular basis. So um, it is a good thing. It empowers us to ask the question about why he's there. Yes, so. and we welcome that kind of accountability and transparency, and uh, we should be having this conversation. I have a question about Merrick Garland, and I'm wondering if the President would like to see him confirmed in the next legislative session after the election. Well, listen, the President believes that uh, Merrick Garland is somebody who can serve the American people on the Supreme Court with distinction, and he absolutely believes that the United States Senate, uh, in particular Republicans in the United States Senate, should do their job. They should consider his nomination, they should meet with him, they should give him a hearing, and they should give him a vote. And the fact that he's waited more than 200 days for that vote is appalling when you consider the credentials that he has. He is the most experienced Supreme Court nominee in history when you consider that he's served more years on the federal judiciary than any other Supreme Court nominee in history. He is somebody who is rated by the American Bar Association as unanimously well qualified. Uh, he is somebody who's been described by Republicans as a consensus pick. And he is somebody who has demonstrated a clear commitment and expertise when it comes to public service. He prosecuted, or he led the investigation and prosecution of uh, one of the worst uh, uh, terror acts in American history. So he's put terrorists behind bars. He knows what it takes to keep the American people safe. Uh, that's why the president, uh, for all those reasons, that's why the president has put him forward. And it is, uh, it is outrageous that Republicans in the Senate have refused to even meet with him, even though they don't call into question his credentials. Commitment from uh, from Hillary Clinton uh, if she becomes president to uh, nominate him. No, again. Uh, we don't. Uh, if she is, if the vacancy has not been filled when she takes office, she will be the president of the United States, and she will be able to put forward whomever she believes uh, should fill the vacancy. And I hasten to add that she has said many times that the president made an excellent choice when nominating Mary Garland. Uh, and I think that is part of why you have seen basically unanimous uh, support among Democrats on Capitol Hill uh, for this nomination. Uh, those Democrats recognize the same thing that Secretary Clinton does, which is that he is enormously qualified, he is a devout public servant, and he's somebody who could serve with honor and distinction on the Supreme Court. But when she's elected president, she will be the one that is entrusted with the power to uh, nominate uh, uh, Chief Judge Garland or someone else to fill a vacancy in the Supreme Court. I don't see where I'm going with this, but do you feel like it would be hypocritical for Republicans uh, to vote in favor of Merrick Garland or push his nomination uh, after saying that they wouldn't if uh, they turn around and do so in the next legislation <clears throat> after if Hillary Clinton were to get elected? I know there's a hypotheticals in there, yeah. but do you think yeah. it would be hip hypocritical for Republicans to turn around and and vote in favor of Merrick Garland and to push his nomination in the next election, uh, legislative session? Let me, I'm going to try to answer your question as directly as I can, which is that the, every member of the United States Senate, including Republicans, swore an oath to fulfill their duties as a United States Senator and to do so upholding the Constitution of the United States. And the fact is Republicans have not done their job. Unfortunately, Leader McConnell actually spent part of his seven-week vacation bragging about, about not doing his job. That would explain some of uh, his party standing in the polls. Uh, but it also is having a negative impact on our federal judiciary as a country. There are, have, were at least a couple of high-profile cases that were heard in the Supreme Court uh, earlier this year where the court was unable to reach a decision because they were split four to four. And so it's starting to have an impact on the functioning of the highest court in the land. And that has an impact on the country where you essentially have a law interpreted different ways based on where people live. Uh, and that's, uh, that is not a path that we, uh, that we want to go down when we're talking about uh, policies that have a direct impact on our constitutional rights as Americans. So um, look, the, the point I'm trying to make here is Republicans have forced Merrick Garland to wait 217 days. And even after waiting 217 days, he is still not being given the opportunity to have a hearing 
and his nomination has still not received a vote. Actively uh, advise Democrats if they won the Senate to push his nomination through, and do you have a commitment from them to do so if they win the Senate? Well, again, the President is certainly going to urge the United States Senate to confirm Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. And um, he's been doing that for 217 days, and unfortunately Republicans have refused to do their job. The reason they haven't done their job is because they know that if they gave him a hearing, he would impress people. And they don't want to have to face questions about why they won't vote for him. So they figured it'll just be easier if we don't give him a hearing. That way, people are less likely to raise questions about the fact that we won't vote to confirm him because we won't be able to explain why we can't confirm him. So, you know, Michelle was talking about the notion of uh, the word rigged being injected into our political system. Yes, with regard to the way that Merrick Garland has been treated, it's been rigged against him by Republicans in a way that from um, Harry Reader or Chuck Schumer to push his nomination through if they win the Senate. So I, I'm not aware of any sort of commitment like that. What I have seen is both Senator Reid and Senator Schumer and just about every other Democrat in the United States Senate say that Merrick Garland would do an excellent job on the Supreme Court. And after the election, regardless of the outcome, the president is going to continue to make a strong case that the United States Senate should act on, on Chief Judge Garland's uh, nomination. He, that's Look, there, there's no real question here about his credentials. Even Republicans acknowledge, the few of them that have agreed to meet with him, have acknowledged that he is somebody uh, of the highest integrity and of the, has the intellectual firepower that's necessary to ably protect the constitutional rights of the American people in, in serving on the Supreme Court. So this has nothing to do with his credentials. Everybody, uh, again, I, it's very difficult to find a reason to oppose him, which is why Republicans don't even want to consider him. And that's uh, uh, unfortunate in part because it's their job to consider him. They ran for this job. No one asked them to do it. No one forced them to do it. They ran for this job to accept this responsibility to ensure the effective functioning of the third branch of government. And that's being undermined right now because of Republicans' willingness to abdicate one of their most basic responsibilities uh, in the United States Senate. Okay. Hopefully this will be a topic of some discussion in the debate tonight. So we'll tune in and find out. Thank you, guys.